All right. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Glad everyone's thrilled to be here and excited. High energy, a lot of love and compassion. Uh, we might have to crank that music up a little bit, Michael. Um, we have a great panel today. My name is Jake Rowe. I'm a partner at PMB. We're a healthcare developer focused exclusively on the continuum of care. Panel is really exciting. Um, Tanya Burnett. Tanya is the Senior Director of Architecture and Planning with Johns Hopkins University. Um, we have Cleve Harrelson. Cleve is the Vice President of Real Estate and Capital Projects at Kindred Healthcare. Uh, we have Jeff Land. Jeff is the System VP of National Real Estate Services at Common Spirit Health. And we have Dr. John Milne. Um, John is the SVP of Real Estate Construction at Providence Health. So amongst these four uh, individuals and their organizations, there's over 400,000 employees, uh, 400 hospitals, 2,000 clinical locations. Uh, I believe that one, at least one of these providers uh, provides care in all 50 states. And combined, they're looking at aggregate $70 billion of annual revenue. So needless to say, it's a formidable group and uh, one that's um, making an impact in healthcare and, and also, I'm sure, you know, a challenge like the rest of us. Um, we wanted to open it up, um, I guess, maybe do like a quick intro, 15 to 30 seconds from each person, maybe a little bit more about your role, and uh, maybe something you did recently that was fun, like <laughs> Saturday, what like, can you tell people like about? Lady that? Gaga Saturday night in right. Vegas. Get tickets, they're stupid expensive, but go. Um, let's see, so I'm actually a Senior Director for Architecture and Planning for Johns Hopkins Health System, sorry, not the university, we are two separate entities. We have six hospitals, uh, one in Florida, one in DC, the rest in Maryland. Um, basically, one of our big challenges is the Maryland reimbursement system, which uh, the rest of the country might be facing depending on who gets elected next. Interesting. So, uh, Cleve Harrelson, uh, Kindred Healthcare, and something, something fun that I've done recently is um, reseed my pasture. I've got to live on a farm, and uh, right before this cold snap is hit in Nashville, I got to go out and reseed my whole pasture. So. It's a lot of fun. If anybody's looking for weekend work, um, I can help you out. Um, but uh, you know, Kindred, uh, we actually have partnerships with um, both Providence and uh, Common Spirit, and maybe one day Hopkins. But we are uh, all over the country. Not quite 50 states, but we do have 117 uh, different facilities and about 2,000 sites of service, just with uh, contract labor and managed units throughout the country with uh, folks like Providence, Common Spirit, and others. I'm Jeff Land. I serve as Senior Vice President for Corporate Real Estate or National Real Estate Services at Common Spirit. Uh, last uh, February, we became one organization combining Legacy Dignity Health with uh, Catholic Healthcare Initiatives. And together we have about 150,000 employees, a little over about 800 care locations and 150 hospitals. Uh, the um, fun part of that i mean i was going to say the merger but i'm really i want to be tanya so <laughs> i'd really rather go to las vegas and see lady gaga so that's my thing john uh john milne so province of joseph health because if you aren't familiar with uh we're in the western united states we have 51 acute care hospitals about 45 million square feet uh, worth of uh, real estate assets uh, across alaska washington montana oregon california texas new mexico and uh, so as we look at that overall, that portfolio, the built environment, uh, my team really has responsibility around uh, the real estate transactions, design, construction, master planning, uh, as well as facility maintenance, EVS, kind of all report up through that uh, system level uh, process. And so I guess fun for me, I guess my Saturday night, This I'm an ER doc, and so I actually spent this last Saturday night working in the ER. Um, so uh, I don't know if that was fun or not. Um, <laughs> the most interesting thing I've recently done, I started taking salsa lessons recently. So, um, you know, kind of, it helps in the ER a little bit. You can do kind of shuffle and tap dance around things. So. That's definitely interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. interesting. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, maybe, maybe John, you can kick us off, you know, wearing both your administrative uh, hat as well as your physician hat. Um, <clears throat> Providence has been vocal and public about talking about transforming from a healthcare company to a population health company. Kind of what, what does that mean for you guys? And then what are the impacts it, it may have on the, your real estate portfolio? No, I think that's, that's uh, really important to start thinking about, you know, Kaiser obviously has been in the population health business uh, for a long time. A number of other companies as we, as we look at 
uh, where healthcare is going are looking at how do we really think about, instead of being a sick care company, how do we become a health company? And how do we shift um, our thinking and our strategy moving forward with that? And so uh, really the pivot for us starts to begin with, historically we've been very hospital centric. And you think about the real estate, uh, it, we, it really begins with master planning around a hospital campus, and then you add in the medical office uh, portfolio or, around that. But if we then flip it and say, that's all about the doctor, that's all about the caregiver, that's all about the individual uh, who's, who's the employee and how do we bring patients to us and take care of them once they get sick. But if we're sitting there and asking the question, how do we now keep people healthy, it has to have a broader uh, uh, perspective. And so as we think about master planning, our team has begun talking about what does it look like to do community-based master planning? How do we embed in social determinants of health? How do you think about housing? How do you think the broader community beyond just the four walls of the hospital? What does it look like beyond that? And be able to have a, have a broader perspective. If we're managing risk for that entire population, things like food becomes important and nutrition becomes important. And how am I managing diabetes, not just when somebody is presenting in DKA to me in the ER, but ultimately how do I manage them in a way that prevents those things from happening? How do we think about the fact that um, high fructose corn syrup is a huge determinant in our populations uh, of underlying diabetes. And how do we think about, uh, how do we teach people to eat better so that they're able to avoid those types of things in their diet? And so it becomes a broader perspective for us around, uh, around really the larger communities we think about the population. And so from a real estate perspective and from a, a built environment perspective, it, it starts incorporating a larger group of partners for us. So how do we think about out, uh, workforce housing? How do we think about partnering with folks who are doing multifamily housing and doing retail and commercial type real estate projects? What does it look like to be doing uh, various types of of broader scale uh, development in a way that health and healthcare is a component to it, but it's not the single component of what we're doing because really it's about how do we influence that larger community. Great. Tanya, you have, um, from an academic medical center perspective, you guys are obviously focused on clinical care, education, and research. Um, being in Maryland, you have a global payment model. What, is, <clears throat> what does population health mean to you guys as an entity? Well, in Maryland, we don't have a choice. It's not a business model. It is the way the state is structured. Um, basically, for people who don't know, we have goal-based goal reimbursement. So you get reimbursed based on the population you serve, and they have a metric that they use to d distribute people who are in overlapping um, primary service areas. And you, there is no incentive to go out and get other patients. So there, there's no, you don't want to go plant your seed somewhere or plant your flag you know, 100 miles away and go get those patients because you're not going to get any additional reimbursement. Um, so it's kind of changes things that way. And because you have a uh, sort of capitated system, you're, you're incentivized to take care of it from a population health model. We're lucky that we had the Bloomberg School of Public Health as part of the Hopkins family. So we're looking at a lot of things with them. It's a very robust program. I think most of it's probably typical for what you're seeing right now. One of the new focuses is on the behavioral health side and um, residential crisis centers and those kind of things to keep a lot of this influx that's coming to the emergency department to keep people stable out of crisis in the community. That's probably the biggest new um, uh, initiative that we have that I think is rather, otherwise we're just going to build bigger and bigger, bigger emergency departments, psych departments within those to house these people for three, four, five, six a month because there's no for, nowhere for them to go. If we can stabilize them at home or in crisis centers, we'll do a lot better. So that's probably been the biggest new shift. Jeff, when you look at the combined common spirit entity, you guys have, you, know, you guys provide care in downtown San Francisco, you provide care in you know, rural Nebraska and everywhere in between. What, how does population health as a, as a mantra or a direction guide what you guys do in your different markets? Well, I think John highlighted a number of things that are actually uh, most of us large healthcare systems have been wrestling with the same thing. I think it's interesting uh, underlying determinants of health are so broad as to, for example, this week we have uh, our sustainability team is at the Vatican meeting with representatives of not only the Vatican, but Google and a few other major uh, employers out there talking about um, our 2030 energy goals, right? 
the utilization of energy, how do we, what does our footprint look like, greenhouse gases and the like, knowing that ultimately, not only that and climate change and its effects, ultimately will determine health in a long-term scale. So it goes so broad. I mean, I throw that out because it's about as far as you can go, I think, a field, but everything between there and what John's talking about, literally the woman who represents her or presents herself in the, in the ED in the middle of winter in Fargo and it's minus 14 degrees and she is freezing to death literally because her heat was turned off in her apartment because she can't pay for it. The reality is how do we explain or how do we begin to define population health in very practical ways? Because frankly, what she needs is heat. She does not need lots of our fancy equipment and so on. What she needs is heat. So whether it's a food desert in the middle of a town or, or uh, simply providing utility assistance or frankly behavioral health, because we get lots of that too, right? It's, it's how do we draw those things together on a grander scale? I'll say one other thing, years ago, we used to talk about these uh, uh, health, what do we call them, uh, wellness centers, right? And we tried to bring together as best we could at the time, uh, disparate services we thought were good for a neighborhood, and we put them all together and stick them in a neighborhood. And really, today, what we know so much better is it goes way beyond that, to the level of we really need to be providing med surge care in homes. There's no reason for that person who's already sick to make them sicker, whether it's sepsis. All the things we do to people we don't want to do to people in hospitals, uh, many of those can be avoided. You know, dropping crash carts or, or interrupting them every 30 or 45 minutes all through the night and so on can be avoided if they have a, a supportive home environment and med surge and many tests around the country on this. We have some, I'm sure you guys do, doing med surge uh, at home. Uh, how much faster they heal and so on. So its impact to real estate, of course, is what is the long-term trajectory of, of essentially what we would call just med surge or, or normal sort of recovery periods and that sort of thing. So Cleve, thanks, Jeff. Cleve, uh, you know, obviously Kindred is known for its post-acute network as an operator and owner and uh, provider. You guys have recently jumped in deep to the behavioral health space uh, entering that world. What is your guys' role uh, as you guys see it in a population health construct with more traditional providers like those on, your, on the stage? You know, our role is to really look at that population and their needs, specifically uh, the aging population in America. You know, this, this is something that comes across news articles, you know, regardless of what medical publication you're reading, there's always something about aging America and people are getting older and having uh, more chronic conditions, more comorbid conditions. And, uh, we have the luxury of being able to team up with, uh, you know, best in class systems across the country that have a need to serve those patients and those communities more. So for us, the, the population management is to figure out how we can take those. I mean, there's, there are 54 million, uh, Medicare beneficiaries today. They're adding 11,000 every single day. Right. An interesting statistic that I just, um, that I was just informed of by our company was that by the year 2035, the 65 and over population will actually outnumber the 18 and under population for the first time. And our goal is to team up with these health systems for uh, long-term acute care, for inpatient rehabilitation, for behavioral health, to be able to serve that aging population. And, and like Jeff mentioned, to provide it in their communities, right? The, the landscape for years, we've been saying it's changing, it's moving more into a community-based care. And, um, it's a lot easier for us to be able to move into those communities and build these smaller, uh, fully licensed hospitals to care for those patients that uh, need 14 days, that need 28 days, that need to be admitted, but you know our short-term acute care partners can't physically keep them and be able to be successful with everything from their reimbursement criteria to, um, to the patient care. Great, thank you for that. <clears throat> um, we're gonna move on. Finally, oh. we're gonna outnumber the younger Bye. folks. This is so exciting. This is great. That's the most encouraging thing I heard today. Thank you for that. All right. Jeff, it's not that exciting. Well, kind of. Well, yeah. okay. that's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Jeff, I'm going to stick with you for a second here. Um, you had you know, just two massive nonprofits coming together. Uh, a lot of similarities probably at some level, a lot of differences at other level. You're now leading um, 
a lot more people, a lot more markets, a lot more projects. With that come a lot more capital asks. How do you guys start to prioritize from the combined system, prioritize you know, capital needs, capital um, plans? Well, just sticking, I guess, with the capital question, obviously both legacy organizations had enormal, uh, enormous sort of backlogs, if you will, of things they wanted to accomplish. I think we had to start really with the transformative strategies around what are we going to do as a population health company? What will we focus on? And begin to rerun the filters as uh, according to uh, re, I guess, recompiling, if you will, the, uh, the ask on both sides. I mean, if you look at just uh, straight how many, how big was the bread box, I think in both organizations combined, I think I had requests that exceeded five and five billion and change, and that's a big number. So I think, uh, did we really need to do that? Probably not. How do we, how do we shake it out? It has to really start with the strategies uh, really developed at the local levels and coming up which we did that in Chicago about a week ago. Uh, we look forward to our you know, one and five year long range strategic plans for that, and then begin to prioritize that according to uh, where we think the company's going. So, I mean, I don't know that there's a, yeah. no, no magic in that, but that's kind of how we do it. John, Providence has gone through a, you know, a, a kind of a restructuring at the C-suite, um, more of a centralized, staffing model, I would say, relative to certain corporate departments, real estate being one of them. Historically, there was, going back a ways now, but historically, a lot of the local hospital administrators were uh, making decisions that involved real estate and, and others. That's no longer the case. How do you guys approach um, kind of change, change management, behavioral change relative to systems, uh, boards, CSIC, capital, <laughs> et cetera? Um. It's been a challenge. So I, I, if, if you've got good insights for me, I'd really appreciate it. Because I think, you know, so any of you have lived through mergers and realized that you're bringing cultures together. And this is the, the transformational sort of piece of how do you manage uh, cultural uh, uh, processes. And, and people, uh, you know, have their cheese moved, you know, to use that overused, you know, analogy in that piece. And it's a, it's a challenge. So for us as an organization, uh, Providence, if you go back uh, 15 to 20 years, really was a holding company. You know, we, we was a very lean, light structure at a, at a larger corporate level, and most of the operational decisions were made at the local individual hospitals, and the local uh, individual CEOs had a high degree of autonomy with regard to their ability to access capital, to be able to make uh, capital decisions, and really were driving their P&L. As, as we've kind of come together as a system, really over the last four or five years, becoming even more so integrated together as more of an operating company at, at a system level with trying to take advantage of the, the economies of scale um, that are there. And so um, it's been a journey for us. It, it, you know, it has not been a smooth road to be able to, to get to, you know, how do you prioritize uh, capital? How do you look at what, um, you know, what, what are the right priorities as a system moving forward? How do we modernize going forward? versus how do we reinvest in our legacy infrastructure to be able to keep the, the traditional acute care business uh, going. And that has been an ongoing uh, balance uh, for us. And I, don't, I wouldn't say we've got it uh, nailed down. What we're trying to do, though, is pro promote a culture where Overall, we're thinking as a system. How do we get our individual hospitals bought into and thinking about uh, the process that we're part of something bigger than ourselves? And there's advantages and obviously disadvantages to being part of a larger organization. There's some bureaucracy that goes with, uh, with size and scale, but there's also some advantages to be able to look at how do we you know, learn lessons across markets? How do you not operate in those individual silos? So it's an ongoing piece for us. Not to mention, I'm turning my, my partners here as we change with the gap rules and, and whatnot around leases. And you know, now that leases are hitting the balance sheet as a, you know, our, our old go-to of, well, just have a developer do it for you, doesn't quite work the same way it does. And I'm, you know, I'd be curious to the rest of you, how do you deal with capital of, is it internal capital? Do you borrow and bring on debt? Do you bring on a development partner? Uh, what, how are other systems dealing with that? You know, I'd like to make a comment about the Catholic system heritage you know, that we both share. Uh, you know, I think uh, both of our organizations, if you look back into Catholic healthcare's history, there is a long history of uh, autonomy at the local level, a lot of leaders being empowered. And I think uh, we had the same issue. I mean, Dignity Health went through about 15 years of centralizing that. 
and now as we we have our uh, brethren from CHI coming in, we have a whole new. I, I feel like I'm starting 15 years ago again to bring that back around to where we can centralize it and manage all of our capital centrally. So it's it's interesting you mentioned that because I think it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah, but on the accounting side, you know, we um, we actually made the decision back when Moody's. Uh, years ago, it's been about 10 years ago now, Moody's wrote an opinion, our bonding agencies, one of them, uh, wrote an opinion about the capitalization of leases and how to, how to weigh it uh, as to debt capacity. And when you look at how they instructed us to weigh it, it was so close to what this new accounting gap rule is that we adopted it at that time. So starting about 10 years ago, we actually, and, and PMB knows this as well as anyone, began to favor using our own capital uh, or financing it ourselves internally in order to deliver it because we knew ultimately it would be added back to our debt and therefore influence our overall debt capacity. So on the dignity side of that, we, we have had that position for about 10 years, assuming that it would, it would ultimately go this way. Now what's interesting is on the CHI side, we, we merged in February. In March, I took a 400,000-foot MOB that was actually outsourced to Trammell Crow and brought it back inside because it simply made on an NPV basis over about a 30-year life. It was attached to a major project we were building. It was worth over $60 million to us. And as a not-for-profit health care organization, that's a lot of care that we get to provide rather than sending it outside. So. We will favor the leverage of our own assets now, uh, just almost by roof. So, any more comments on that? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that uh, the, the the lease accounting changes are optimistic for us. Uh, you know, I, we're looking forward to the additional competition that I think is going to draw because flipping those operational lease to the capital lease is now keeping them on that balance sheet. Um, you know, we're still an operations company you know as much as i would like for us to be a real estate company and be able to enjoy some of those benefits and some of those multiples ours are based on those operational successes and uh what i think it's going to do for us and what we've you know talked about internally is that uh the cost of capital being what it is uh in our own house versus outside with you know pnb and others uh, we're just we're going to see some additional competition where those numbers get down a little bit and hopefully we'll be able to increase our operational benefit uh, even though we have to carry some on our credit agreements our bonding reports. Well, welcome back from the dark yeah i'm happy to be here i'm very excited <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah developers really needed to learn how to operate the assets they were building jeff was at lunch we were talking and jeff was thinking about kicking off this whole presentation with a, a joke or a knock to developers to get everyone on the same page, get some energy going. I waited. I'm, I'm glad he, I'm glad right, he waited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we appreciate it. So um, let's move on, moving on to the next topic here. Um, I'll abstain from that question because I'm biased. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about efficiencies in real estate portfolios, you know, costs, I mean, when you look at total delivery, total cost of care, a component, component of it is, is real estate and a bigger component of it is the operation of that facility over, over long-term holds. I guess opening it up to anyone, are there any areas of low-hanging fruit in terms of efficiencies in your real estate portfolio that you guys are, are avidly focused on at the moment? We're primarily focused on flexibility and adaptability over time. I know that's an age-old statement but um, we get to build so rarely. Again, thank you, Marilyn. There's, there's, we, do, we used to get, even though we, we were rate controlled, when you built a capital project, your um, reimbursement got adjusted to cover the interest on that capital. Okay, so at least you got that. Now there's nothing. You're, n you're not adjusted in any way about your reimbursement when you build. So obviously if you're, going from semi-private rooms to private rooms, there's no additional income coming in, so it's a complete expense. Now, it's a capital expense, which is better than a bottom line expense, but we have to make sure that every one of these capital dollars is really bringing us the ability to do higher quality care at a lower cost of care. And so the, the bar is raised very high. Um, and what's interesting about that 
is sometimes a little bit bigger building makes sense. So it looks like a higher initial capital investment, but we know over time that, that we're going to get more bang for a buck out of that. That's a really hard conversation right now we're having internally. Um, because leadership just goes, well, you know, just make it smaller, just make it this. And um, fortunately, I'll just get a little snippet. We're doing an ambulatory care center. We're not very good at making money at ambulatory care centers. A little revealing of Hopkins. We just brought a new fellow in. We've hired him, not as a consultant, we've in house hired him. And we were looking at an ambulatory care center in a new MOB. And it was struggling with the size. He advocated two 600 square foot ORs so we can do total joints two procedure rooms sized at 450 so they qualify as ORs in the future, and prep and recovery space is a 3.5 ratio to both sets of rooms. He goes, I can make money at that. That's actually a little bit bigger than we were doing when we thought it was two ORs and three procedure rooms. One less room, bigger space. Again, finance people, business planning people are going, wait, wait, wait. I got Brian there going, guys, stop it. It's not just making money today. Yes, it has to make money day one, but this has to work over time. Having that voice in the room was transformational over the last month of my life. Um, because now I feel like the decisions are really based on, it's not just the head of architecture, sorry, the head of uh, facilities advocating this, it's somebody who knows how to run it. So that's probably something that I wanna see more often in the room. It's not just the downstream finance guy spitting back the dollars, but somebody saying, I know how to run it, I know how to make money. That's interesting because oftentimes, <clears throat> oftentimes flexibility comes at a cost. It does. So if you have a long-term perspective, you know, there's, a, there's a business logic and a business plan to say, if we look out 30, 40, 50 years in this facility, ultimately you know, those, those upfront, that upfront premium for future flexibility yep. is gonna be well worth it. John, when you guys look at uh, you know, an indefinite um, operating period as an entity, um, some, of these real, some of the real estate you guys are getting involved in, these are you know, long, long, long-term commitments. How do you, how do you balance upfront costs relative to ongoing operating expenses? I mean, it has been an ongoing challenge for us. I mean, you've got that lump sum right at the front end and how do, how do you get past that? But I think we're getting better at it, of looking at energy utilization, what is the operating cost moving forward? But more importantly, our number one cost as a system is labor. And so how do we think about what's the actual labor that's gonna, going to be there? And so as we think about planning, um, we're still not great at it, I wouldn't say, but in terms of how do we think about what's the staffing plan going forward? How do you, how do you look at what the um, optimization is? And, and we're able to, uh, at times, bring in, say, oh, let's, let's optimize the, optimi uh, the operations before we then redesign around existing processes that may or may not be um, effectively there. And so I think that's the ongoing, it's a, it's, a, it's a sea change in terms of how you think about that, that larger piece. But you know, you're talking about the escalation piece. I think, you know, uh, and your, your point about you know, kind of climate change and the larger you know, kind of carbon footprint and global warming, these are pieces in the conversation that historically haven't necessarily always been there. And I think that's gonna be an ongoing growing uh, kind of component to it as we think about our projects and try to calculate in, you know, is, what is the cost of this project? And as we move forward with that, how do we optimize over that 30, 40 year life cycle of a building? So let's stay on the, the labor component of that for a second. Obviously, the competition for healthcare labor is, is fierce um, all over the country, especially in the, the larger MSAs. There's a lot of challenges that come, come with that. We've spoken a little bit about this in terms of housing. Um, transportation, those types of functions. When you guys are looking at new facilities, how often are you making decisions on kind of the built environment piece where it's majorly or at least significantly influenced by the your workforce versus maybe the patient? Obviously, you're looking at all factors, but how much is there a workforce component? I'd say at least for us, we, it hasn't been, um, at least uh, to my knowledge, a, a, you know, a major driver. I think it needs to be a, a larger one, especially if we look at the graying of our workforce. Uh, our average nursing uh, age is 52. And so you look at that, uh, that piece of, of, of we're going to be in an increasing uh, labor shortage um, around uh, skilled nursing positions and how do we leverage across uh, broader portfolios being able to uh, you know, capture the talent that we need to and retain the talent that's there, particularly in our growing metro areas where you mentioned you know, you know, workforce housing. You know, we uh, you know, have a hospital in uh, Santa Monica 
none of our staff can afford to live in Santa Monica. And so if everybody's you know, commuting in two hours for a $16 an hour job, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't fit. And so there's a lot of ongoing challenges and, and thinking in a much broader holistic piece of how do we optimize our, our labor markets. I think though historically as well, uh, systems have had a, I think too myopic a view about where their responsibility is in, uh, to hire and where they should hire from. Uh, about two weeks ago, I think it was Walmart that announced they would actually pay for any one of their employees to go after a degree in one of five healthcare uh, disciplines. They would literally pay for the entire thing. I think they were to charge them a dollar a day over like a five year period with the stated intention that they would populate out of their own workforce over time a, a, a sustainable level of healthcare employees on the retail outright side. So they would, they would cover their own uh, prescriptions or pharmacists. They would cover you know, some of their mid-levels, some, uh, some of their nursing or uh, uh, providers or uh, nurse practitioners in, their, in what they have now started the test in, I guess it's in um, uh, Georgia now, they have five freestanding primary care clinics in the parking lots of their stores. These, these disruptors, this idea, how, how do we deliver it, where it needs to be delivered, and how do we sustainably deliver uh, the training, the people, and so forth to do it? Certainly is not the continuum, and certainly not lots of things we could throw rocks at them all day, and we do. But, <laughs> Nonetheless, they are causing a disruption to us that ultimately will deliver care. And I would be surprised if we don't find ourselves partnering with any number of these major uh, organizations up to and including around the issues of training. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. Oh, go ahead, Tanya. I was just saying that one of the key drivers we have as far as both staff retention and uh, attracting new staff is, is staff safety. Um, we live in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore is a beautiful place. It really doesn't resemble what you see on television at all. Um, it's, but downtown is like any other downtown. Uh, and so when you've got, a, you've got campus safety, you know, basically from the point you park your car all the way inside, and then you've got safety from, uh, for staff, for um, people coming in the hospital who um, might have uh, ideas that we would rather them not do. So we have to make our campus more safe without creating a fortress-like system. Um, I think that that's probably that patient's experience um, balanced with uh, staff safety is probably one of the biggest things we're looking at as we get both existing facilities and new facilities. And therefore, as you sort of start to think, okay, what does that mean in terms of what should be in inner city Baltimore, what should be further out? more in the suburbs and that kind of thing. And then we have to weigh that against the hub that is the School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins Hospital, where the residents are and how they're going to um, get their training if we go out in the satellites. That's another sort of constant back and forth we're doing of, of weighing the pros and cons. Interesting. So Jake, I wanna say that, you know, for this, I, I'm, I'm looking at this at actually a different, more literal point of question, I think, and uh, you know, the efficiencies and tackling cost escalations. Um, operationally is one thing, and you know there's there's a lot of opportunity to do that, providing the environment for the staff, providing a desirable place for them to go. But you know the biggest thing related to tackling cost escalations that I'm seeing is actually in the development process overall, right? And I know there's a lot of folks in this room that are more integrated with the development group than they are with the facility operations, and I think that's the real challenge that we're seeing is how, with our ability and our growth cycle where we're building you know, five, 10, 15 new facilities over the next two years, our big concern is that we can't get the, the construction labor force to show up, right? Because everybody's busy. Everybody that wants a job has a job. And so the cost escalations that we're seeing are impacting uh, the overall project cost, regardless of the efficiencies that we have in a design, in a facility, in the environment. Uh, it's the labor force that's there to put it together. And that's where we're seeing a problem that we uh, don't have an answer to. But um, well, we're, we're looking forward we're to figuring it out. I, I thought that the topic was interesting because tackling cost escalations. No one on this stage or in this room, frankly, uh, can tackle it. No. It's not to be tackled. We ride the wave of cycles in the economy and in real estate 
across the country. And so, okay, you got to take that out. Uh, the question might be better said, how will you come alongside? How will you deliver the care that needs to be uh, delivered in spite of escalations issues? And that can have something to do with the efficiencies, but nonetheless, finding another plumber in, in Las Vegas when you're competing with the downtown with the uh, uh, casinos, good luck with that. Yeah. Our, our reimbursements I've been don't there. change. It wasn't fun. Yeah. yeah. We exactly. get paid the same amount regardless of how much the building costs. That's right. Yeah. It's interesting when you're talking about the kind of the total means of production of healthcare and uh, the, the labor component's interesting. I've heard it's roughly two thirds of the cost of the 18% of the GDP in this country. And um, when you start to talk, talk about you know, staffing and recruitment and retention and training, you have the Kaisers of the world opening a new medical school, the Kaiser Way in, in Pasadena. I mean, they're, you know, they're going from the ground up and training, training people directly into their system for that organic reoccurring um, you know, employee base, which is pretty interesting. Does anyone on the panel think they can talk about this one? Cleve, why don't you give this one up? So um, interesting, you know, post-acute behavioral health, these under a, under a managed care, risk-based contracting, population health model, whatever semantics you want to use, this is becoming, you know, incredibly important. Behavioral health is moving from the, you know, an afterthought really where it should be in the primary care piece of healthcare delivery. Um, Cleve, your guys' business is, is, you're getting a lot of partnerships. You guys are doing it really well. Tell us about what's driving yeah, your group. Yeah, business is all right right now. We're doing, we're doing okay. Um, for us, uh, you know, this, this just gives me the opportunity to kind of talk about our partners because, uh, you know, I, I was meeting with some folks earlier and we'll uh, refrain from the names, but, uh, you know, one thing that I was saying is that, you know, we've got, and I just mentioned, uh, 15 new hospitals coming out of the ground in the next two years. Uh, not one of them is going to say kindred rehabilitation or kindred behavioral health. They don't have our name on it. Uh, and that's because, um, you know, we're, we're drafting behind our partners. We're, we're drafting behind Common Spirit and, and Providence. Um, and what we found is that our partners and the greater community has a need for this care. They have a need for behavioral health. They have a need for inpatient rehabilitation. And it's, um, it's not a sexy role. You know, it's not. People, people don't want to spend a lot of money on it. So uh, what, what gets the donations are women's and children's and cancer care and things that are more prevalent and available in society. So what we're able to do is team up with uh, one of these best in class providers and provide that community based care specific to what we're really good at. And that is this post acute spectrum of offering. So um, for us, it's really a matter of finding the gap that, that is perfectly necessary. It's absolutely necessary. If anyone in here has had a, a family member, a friend suffer through a stroke, some sort of traumatic brain injury, uh, you know, you see the importance of that line of care. And, uh, you know, fortunately for us, we are able to find and team up with people that also see the benefit and, uh, and want to provide that service. And so it, it's a very exciting time. And, um, I think we've got we've got relationships with a lot of people in this room actually to help us do that and so we're we're going to do more of it and we're lucky we'll I think I think the important thing to note with that is is and I, I'm wearing my clinician hat for a second so I, as I kind of hinted earlier I'm, I'm an emergency physician by, by background I kind of came up through the hospital administration side before I flipped to the dark side of real estate and the um, and I still practice uh, part-time in the ER and the, the thing that's most critical as I see it you know the ER becomes the collecting point of when people are falling through the gaps and don't quite fit into the, the, the system and so uh, the, the the spectrum of what is post acute I think is is broadening for all of us to be able to it used to be very nice discreet buckets of okay here's your LTAC and here's your SNF and here's your long-term you know assisted living sort of a scenario those lines really start to become much more fuzzy and blurry as we start to think about how do we avoid 30-day readmissions or how do we think about you know because as it used to be that the, the acute care hospital was kind of the catch-all when you know they didn't know where else to put somebody else in a nice clean, clean bucket and the fact that we're trying to keep people out of the hospital as best we can means that our infrastructure that we need to be building 
beyond that um, is is much more important than it ever was. And you know, Jake, you know, we were talking earlier today about you know what does senior living look like? What is the what is that broader spectrum of, of what housing looks like? And how do you then integrate into you know more of a post acute environment? That whole spectrum, I think, is where a lot of growth opportunity is for all of us across the the healthcare spectrum as we look at how do we care for populations more effectively. Is making sure that the the transitions of care from one level to the other are seamless and, and the patients are able to move easily there. And for us as clinicians, we don't have to sit and re-engineer it every time, though it feels like it's a very clunky process right now. Absolutely. And I, I think on the behavioral health front, you know, for those, there's, I'm sure many people in here have been touched personally by a behavioral health episode that you know, I have as well. And those ones, you know, those are real. I mean, those are real issues you've been through, you know. When I start to think about the way that it's currently treated, and it's an absolute gap in the system, right? Where they come in the ER, they're stabilized 24, 48 hours, and they're, you know, there's the door, kind of send them right back off, and there's no, there's no rehabilitative element to it. So when you talk about crisis stabilization and these combination facilities that have behavioral health space, there's support services, there's some social programs, there's a residential short to medium ter stay, term stay component where you can you know, get these people back on their feet, get them acclimated, ready to assimilate back into society. Those are some incredibly interesting conversations we've been having with, with a bunch of providers uh, and counties, frankly. Um, Tony, you mentioned uh, that behavioral health is a big, uh, you know, a big pillar right. of what you guys are working on. Tell us a little more about that. Um, it was interesting, a few months ago, our um, uh, CMO, Chief Medical Officer, uh, did a, called a meeting, sent out to a bunch of folks and called it, what are we gonna do with neuro neurobehavioral patients? And 50 people crammed into a room that was probably made for 30s. First time that ever happened at Hopkins where more people showed up for a meeting than were invited. Um, and, um, and he just went, wow, okay, I guess this is something we need to figure out. And it's broken into five groups now where there's a, there's a lot of um, movement and sort of long story short, because well, I guess long story beginning, there's still a lot to go. Um, the comorbidities between medical and uh, whether you call it behavioral health or, or mental health or psychiatric care, any of anything that any of those areas is growing. I was at a hospital um, last week, and they believe that uh, very soon, 15 to 20 percent of their medical patients will have comorbidities with behavioral health or psychiatric issues. Think about that. What that means in terms of what those rooms need to look like. We can't just count on one-on-one -on -one sitters for the rest of our lives, right? So um, you start, you know, residential crisis, keep them home, all of those kind of things. Um, what happens when they get to the ED? How is that dealt with? Where do they go from there? There's not enough places. The state of um, Maryland closed down all inpatient psychiatric facilities. They're relying totally on um, the hospitals to, to um, deal with this. And we have 88 adult behavioral health beds, which is far more than our percentage based on our demographic. <laughs> We're not exactly interested in growing that percentage, but we also do that, those 88 patients very well. We have a much longer length of stay. And at first blush, everybody looks at that and goes, oh, you got a problem with length of stay. But our readmission rate, in fact, never readmission rate is very low. A lot of these patients may stay longer than they do in other places, but they're, they're, they're getting out and being able to stay out of the system. So I think that there's a lot of diagnosis that needs to look at how we treat these patients and the com complication of just looking at a number like length of stay or 30-day readmission and saying, oh, that's broken, that's broken. Maybe there's good reasons for it to be. The other thing is the, the site of care and the different levels of patients. I've actually taken in and said that for behavioral health within the hospital environment, we should think of those as critical care. They're not critical care for the typical medical reasons, but these patients and the and the um, risk to themselves and others is, is like a critical care patient. And we tend to think of all behavioral patients as the same. So we're trying to sort of change that. And what does that look like as a kind of critical care behavioral space within as the highest level of care and then maybe sort of more step down, sort of use some of these medical terms for the behavioral health environment. And then what is post-acute getting back into the community? So I, as we look at this, and these five groups are looking at all the, all the locations of care um, and what those facilities need to look like to support them, um, what we're finding is just sort of, uh, is that, first of all, I think psychiatric hospitals, behavioral hosp hospitals need to change what they look like. I don't think they necessarily have to be on medical campuses, 
than what is on the medical campus? Is that that critical care um, piece? And what is, how does that relate to the ED? How does that relate to um, pe not having people end up institutionalized because they're in that vein um, and staying in hospitals for months at a time? Um, so what, we're, what I've been doing as I go out into the world these days is saying, what are other people doing? And it's been interesting getting snippets of information and seeing. So if anybody's with a system or doing anything really innovative in that space, please you know, find my name in there and, and let me know. Be happy to exchange what we're learning with you and, and learn back. Because we, we have to transform it completely. What we have is totally broken. That's yeah. a shot for me. And, we see, and we, we see that. And that's really one thing that yields our first call is when a system figures out that there is that gap, that there needs to be that uh, coverage of care. And I mean, just to, just to put it in perspective for everybody, uh, you know, everyone says, well, we need behavioral health, we need post-acute care, what does that really mean? Well, out of 16 million discharges annually from short-term acute care, about 43% of that, so that's 7 million people, are going to require some sort of post-acute care, otherwise they're gonna wind up back in the hospital, and those readmissions aren't free. So that's why, that's why this is such a big deal, and that's why there's such a gap that we're uh, actively working to fill with our partners. And it's really cool to see, it's cool to see this focus on, on it. You know, it's, it's become, it's been spoken about a lot, and um, it, it seems like there's a different level of intensity and focus around this space, which is, um, as, you know, as an American, it's, it's good to see. All right, so we're talking a little bit about, I mean, we hit a little bit of this earlier, but, you know, the, the, at, at some level, the job of all of us here in this space is to create some level of predictability. And when I think of that, I think about uh, you know, throughput, uh, I think about costs, I think about operating expenses, staffing ratios, stuff like that. And equally as important is to think about flexibility and adaptability into the future to accommodate other iterations of healthcare. Um, when you look at technology, there was a great, you know, great presentation this morning on that. We hit, we hit on a lot of those. Medical advances, how, how do you do that? And what are some of the things you guys think about when, when trying to balance predictability and flexibility, which don't often go you know, in the same vein? John, why don't you start us off? You mean you can't predict flexibility? I mean, I guess the, the biggest thing is, as from my perspective, of what do we know about, uh, you know, what does the hospital of the future really look like? And the, the, the only thing we know is it's gonna be different. I mean, and you know, what does that really look like? I mean, all of us can can pontificate about what we think is going to happen. It's you know probably going to be more you know higher intensity, you know, a higher level of level of, level of acuity. You know, we mentioned hospital at home type of services, and as we're starting to begin to integrate uh, those sorts of concepts into our bed demand forecasting uh, with it. But the, the biggest thing is is what we can predict is the need for the flexibility that's there. What does this chassis look like uh, going forward is is going to be different than what we, we have right now, and how do we make sure that we, we you know build in that adaptability uh, for it? And that's that's tough because it's, as we go to an end user and ask, what do you need? You suddenly are going to design for the existing systems of operation and say, how do you design for the future? Really starts to test um, a lot of those types of, of assumptions. I would say that you know, for us uh, as as a system, we're continuing to learn. We're continuing to evolve into what that looks like uh, moving forward. Um, we don't have it nailed yet um, in terms of our ability to understand it. But as we've got um, internally, uh, for us, have what we refer to as our digital innovation group. We're looking at at how do we how do we are we applying app-based technology? How are we writing the software going forward that's going to transform what that looks like? And continuing to try and, and, and think through that. And we have a variety of, of, of strategic partnerships that are kind of helping us with that with most of the major tech companies. Uh, be, you know, with the advantage of being based in Seattle is we've got access to some of those, uh, those companies that are you know, really trying to lead into what that looks like. That being said, even the, even you know Microsoft, Google, Apple, all the you know the people who've been, been mentioned in these uh, prior organizations, they have a perspective, they have a lens uh, of what they're trying to do, 
do, they don't really have it necessarily nailed either. And I think that's going to be the, the ongoing iteration of how do we try stuff, how do we fail fast, how do we learn and iterate um, along that, and, and that's the nature of, of technology. And for us in healthcare, um, that whole concept of that rapid evolution, how do you put out what is you know, the minimal viable product and try to understand did it work and learn from it is not usually our innovation model. Um, and particularly in real estate where we build something and it's expected to last for the next 50 years, um, you know, the, the, the flexibility of that chassis becomes important for us. Jeff, what about any thoughts in addition to John's? Yeah, I think, you know, I might, I might re, retitle this to predictability and flexibility. I, uh, let's, let's wrap our minds around the idea of agility. Uh, if you look at agility into the future uh, of really more about the rapid response, because no, I do not know what Apple's going to announce tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. But we need to know where it fits into our continuum or if it does, when it happens. And then how fast we can adjust to it is incredibly important. So, uh, so partnerships, it's all about partnerships. And I think John mentioned that a minute ago, but we have partnerships with Apple on, in fact, on, uh, on the interplay on your iPhone for uh, patient records and for uh, the interactivity with a patient in the population. So we've been doing that in the Bay Area right now for a little over a year, uh, but that sort of thing, we're not the only ones doing it. These guys have lots of, there are a lot of good tests in the marketplace, but I think the partnering with major, uh, major tech I mean, I talked about already uh, companies like Amazon, Walmart, and so on, Berkshire Hathaway, others that are in the space making noise have massive amounts of capital and they are willing to explore what's new, what's different, what's next. We have to be able to be agile enough to come alongside of it. And I actually think, and, and I would actually just mention uh, an aside tangentially that, you know, uh, Clyde mentioned, you're not gonna see, um, now, partners like uh, Kindred, you're not going to see Kindred's name on a lot of buildings, even though they're going to be behind it. And I, I think what's interesting about that is I'll tell you Common Spirit Health has zero interest of putting our name on anything. And you'll be challenged to find our name anywhere in the country outside of our regional and system offices. You won't find it on a single hospital because these are, in fact, these are community assets. If you ask people in a neighborhood who owns the hospital, the neighborhood's going to tell you they own the hospital, by and large. In fact, there's been surveys done. But they, they actually believe somehow that they do. Try to close a hospital. If you want to find out whether or not they think <laughs> who owns the hospital, try to close one. You'll find out pretty quick who thinks they own that hospital. And so this issue of branding, co-branding, uh, and so on, partnering becomes just exponentially bigger. So whether it's Kindred, Apple, us working with Providence, whatever. There's going to be partnering all over the place on locally branded items. So Jeff, let me ask one follow-up question. So defining agility is the ability to you know, react and respond efficiently and, and quickly. How much do you guys look at, you know, being agile obviously is important. What about kind of on a proactive basis going to some of these groups and saying, hey, here's what we're struggling with. Let's solve this thing together. I know you guys do quite a bit about. That's really what we were just, you know, what we actually have a whole office dedicated to the, the intellectual property and the growth of it and the experimentation mm -hmm. around it. So that's like the, the Apple thing I just mentioned a moment ago, but there are many, many more like it. In fact, we have a, a co-branded, uh, actually our name's not on it, but we own a, a company that um, has remote monitoring on uh, aspirators. So we can tell when it's being used, where it's being used, how many times it's being used, time of day, temperature, what patient it's on. Literally, we can call that patient and find out on a real-time basis, right? Just one example, but there are dozens like it of those sorts of things that are partnerships uh, with another firm to deliver it. And then I think the agility part is using that data to figure out what do we need to be doing differently to change how the patient is cared for. Sure. So. Michael, um, I want to leave time for Q&A. Yeah, okay. What are your, what leave are your- time for a couple of questions. How are we doing here is the question. Uh, we got about five minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, just real Tanya, quick please. on the research side of, of tech, 
we're doing a new $350 million um, research building that's actually attached to the hospital, um, which we, we have other research attached. It's just the first major building that's been built in a few decades um, on the primary hospital campus that has interconnectivity. Um, interestingly, more than half of the space is dedicated to computational instead of wet labs. Big shift in that when you look at lab buildings even built five years ago. So much of the research is data driven now. It's this instead of um, working in a wet lab. Even the uh, labs set up for wet lab are, have a large computational component and then we have a wing that's all computational. So I think that's feeding right into a lot of the um, information this morning. Right after Ron's presentation, I got one of my little Wall Street Journal messages and it said, I don't know if anybody saw this, that Google and Ascension Health have a secret project called Project Nightingale. And they have hundreds of, of what do they have? No, no, uh, millions of patients, 21 states. They have access to the data. Google, Ascension gave it to them. The hospitals, or the patients and the uh, doctors did not know. It was all HIPAA compliant, so they didn't think they needed to tell anybody. But, you know, this whole thing, you know, do we really trust Google? Um, I have to admit, I sort of looked at that and went, I don't know if I trust Google right now. Um, but I think that all of that data, I mean, it's one thing for us to look at our internal data. It's another for Google to get access from all the 21 hospitals within Ascension. So um, that's, that's going to be driving so much of this. I mean, I really question, you know, how much ambulatory, primary care, ambulatory care we should be building. Because it's really, is primary care going to be our, our, our watch and an iPhone or a smartphone talking to our uh, physician? And, is, and so as we think about investing in ambulatory uh, facilities and doing capital investments, how if they are made up as primary care versus perhaps specialty care or higher level care, um, would they be different from day one? Um, so again, they can flex and adapt over time. All of that is a, a big, again, a big thing that we're examining as we look at capital investment. Thank you, Willem. <clears throat> Why don't we open it up? Yeah, we have, we have time for like two questions. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, let me just bring the mic to you so we can, everyone can hear you. Hi, thank you. So big data analytics, uh, predictive analysis. Uh, how, how would you use uh, EHR, EMR in a cloud without compromising HIPAA? They blind it. Um, you're allowed to have other people use the data if it's uh, scrubbed. Of um, It's still a, a unique patient, but their, their name is taken out. As long as it's for the benefit of the health care of those patients. That's a very quick explanation of how um, HIPAA allows it to happen. One, one more question. Any others? Any additional questions? I'll hand it back over to you, Jake, then. Okay. Closing thoughts, comments, um, anything? I guess, you know, it's a brave new world. So <laughs> I appreciate, you know, I think you've heard it a couple of different times from all of us, is I think you're going to see partnerships uh, going forward that we probably wouldn't have imagined, you know, five, ten years ago, and even, that as, as we look at how do we deliver care, how do we look at our, our, our communities that we all serve, and look at the overall mission that we're trying to advance uh, you know, across this as nonprofits, you know, kind of healthcare entities. You know, that the bottom line for us is how do I how do I serve these communities? How do we do it do it better? How do we do it more efficiently? And so I think you're going to start seeing some more interesting bedfellows as we continue to move forward um, and and look at uh, that broader spectrum. Anything else? Jeff's got to get to a flight. He uh, was threatening to go back to back on karaoke tonight, but that's out. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Well, I want to thank you guys. Great, great discussion. Thank you, Jake, for, uh, for serving as the moderator. And uh, round of applause, everybody.